to try to figure out exactly how things work and then the ripple that you can have from this one discovery would just be amazing. I think people go into science because they're curious, they care about people, and they want to find answers. Everything we do are assays designed to reveal the invisible. We are first and foremost a basic research institute. Basic science is our strength at Gladstone. Basic science with a purpose. We want to take that fundamental knowledge and actually use it, leverage it, to find cures. It's not enough for us just to make discoveries. It's also our mission to make sure that those discoveries ultimately get into people. We've chosen to work in three of the most important areas of disease. Diseases of the heart, diseases of the brain, and diseases caused by uh, deadly viruses. We all have friends and family who have Alzheimer's. Parkinson's, heart disease, HIV. The diseases that we're trying to tackle are so complex. You need to get at them from all kinds of angles. We've created a wonderful environment at Gladstone in which basic scientists work hand in hand with physician scientists, so they help us move things from the research bench into the clinic. With the research and trying to figure out exactly the mechanism of how this disease works and that we're able to prevent it, the number of people that you can then help in the millions. It was by understanding how each of HIV's enzymes work that we were able to come up with inhibitors. And those are now the drugs that are saving people's lives. Research is so versatile and leads in so many unpredictable directions. You have to have this freedom to explore, to actually discover something fundamentally new. We have this training that's not just micro-focused on a particular question, but that you're allowed to think pretty broadly about different questions. It's a big part of being at the Gladstone. Institute. With our work in stem cell biology, we're doing today what even five years ago was science fiction. It's become real. We can now reprogram one type of cell to another. We can turn your skin cell into a heart cell or a brain cell. The excitement of looking under a microscope and seeing a little beating heart cell and realize that that cell began as a skin cell. Most of the real breakthroughs take place outside the established lanes. A great example here, of course, is the creation of the, the IPS cell by Shinya Yamanaka. We're encouraged to take risks, to focus on the science which will make a difference in medicine and in people's lives. I'm very impatient. I really want research to be expanded many-fold. I'm 46 years old, and I was diagnosed at 25. I'm a living miracle. I truly believe that. We're going to be able to treat conditions that are currently incurable. What drives me to spend more time looking at the microscopic level is I can have an impact on a global level. If you keep doing really, really solid science, you can compress that timeline from discovery to implementation. When you're at the very leading edge of what you're doing, it is very risky, it's very time consuming, it's very expensive. Breakthroughs, development of therapeutics, it really always takes a team effort. If we really want these kinds of breakthroughs to happen, then we need to support them in their pursuit for the good of humankind. Work at Gladstone has high promise to be the game changer. I think it really appeals to the core of so many people to hear about what we're capable of and what's on the horizon. Inspiration is the most powerful thing around, and I think, I think Gladstone is, is doing that. They give me hope. What scientists need is freedom to follow wherever the science might lead. It's a combination of many scientists, many, many previous efforts. I think that's the beauty of science. I'm Stephen Fantone. The Peters Lecture is one way that we thank all of you and each of you and everything you do to make Pioneer the strong organization that it is. Jim earlier thanked Bill Tyler and Diane Schmolensey for their leadership over the past few years, and I want to affirm my conviction with his, that their great leadership that they provided, and I think they deserve a separate round of applause for that. <laughs> uh, 
As the incoming chair of Pioneer's Board of Directors, I look forward to working with all of you and also with my vice chairs, Bruce Johnstone and Seal Hicks. Thank you for being willing to serve. What What first drew me to Pioneer was its interest in innovation and thought leadership on big public policy issues. As chairman, I'm most interested in seeing that Pioneer helps our children outcompete with others in the leading nations in the world, that it helps develop affordable and innovative means for providing health care, that it helps create real catalysts for economic growth and proffers solutions that address Massachusetts' unfunded liabilities. To get there, we are going to focus on matching our high-quality research and impressive media work with even more collaborations with civic groups across the Commonwealth and the nation. To get there as a country, we're going to need a lot of solutions that go beyond what government can do. And that means multiplying the number of individuals with the stature and capabilities of our lecturer tonight, Dr. Deepak Srivastava. When it was first suggested that Deepak speak tonight, I admit I was not familiar with his work. So I quickly texted my brother, who was a dean at a medical school. Deepak Srivastava. What can you tell me about this guy, I texted. I got a quick response, and a rather terse one. His response, he is the real thing. Well, what is that real thing? Deepak is an incomparable medical researcher whose team has made extraordinary advances with adult stem cells. His work in regenerative medicine is focused on understanding the cause of heart disease to treat human cardiac disorders. His pioneering research has the potential to help doctors restore heart attack damage by transforming scar tissue into beating heart muscle. The implications of his work are profound. Each of us knows someone who may potentially benefit or we know someone we wished might have lived long enough to benefit from his work. Currently, Deepak is director of the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco, which has a seamless integration with both the University of California, San Francisco, and San Francisco General Hospital. He holds positions as director of the Roddenberry Center for Stem Cell Biology and Medicine, He's a professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Biochemistry, and Biophysics at the University of California. Before joining Gladstone, he was a professor in Pediatrics and Molecular Biology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. This person has gotten around. He's received numerous honors and awards, including endowed chairs, election to the American Society of Clinical Investigations, and most recently to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences located just across the river. He completed his medical training at the Texas Medical Branch in Galveston in his residency in the Department of Pediatrics at UCF, UCSF. He did spend some time in Boston. He did a fellowship in pediatric cardiology at Children's Hospital at Harvard Medical School, and he had a postdoctoral fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston as a Pediatric Scientist Development Program Fellow. Deepak draws strong support from his wife, Denise, an accomplished ICU nurse who currently has her hands full managing their three children. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming our speaker, Dr. Deepak Sivastava. Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me here today. It's a real honor uh, to address this uh, audience, and I've had a chance to learn uh, in the last several weeks more about the Pioneer Institute, and I'm 
uh, truly impressed by the impact that this institute has on in the areas uh, that they focus, many of which are very important and uh, uh, similar, not, not so dissimilar to what we do at the Gladstone Institute. So I'm just going to come back to this slide. Um, now, I want to pick up on one of the individuals you heard in the video you saw. And she said, I'm impatient. I want you to think about that. I'm impatient. That's really important because what we're doing at the Gladstone Institutes and other institutes like ours is really important because people are waiting. And I imagine every one of you in the audience has your own story, either of your loved ones or family members or friends, where they're waiting. In my own, my own story, uh, my, I have 11-year-old twins who were born with uh, hearing loss and wear hearing aids. I hope that someday that'll change. My father has trouble walking up a flight of stairs because he suffered a heart attack 25 years ago and uh, is on a path uh, where there won't be so many options in the near future. My wife suffers a chronic illness uh, for which there's no treatment, and she's in the hospital every other month for 10 days or more. So I'm impatient, and I know you all are impatient. And so what the story I'll tell you today has to do with how we might think about a future in science and medicine where we might be able to solve at least some of these, many of these problems. And that future has to do with some breakthroughs that have occurred in the last few years. And, and Steve asked me a question last night when we were talking about what is it that allows the breakthroughs? And I think, I thought, give it some thought, and I think at the Gladstone Institutes, uh, some of the secret to our success has been to foster creativity, provide sufficient resources for scientists to pursue their sometimes crazy ideas, uh, and make sure that you have the cutting edge technology needed to make the breakthroughs. None of, the three, none of those three are sufficient by themselves, but together, if you get the right balance, I think you can make great breakthroughs, and that's what I'll talk about today. Now, the story I'll tell you today has to do with our, our ability now in 2012 to almost at will alter the fate and behavior of a cell, to change one cell type to another almost at will. Now, this a few years ago would be considered science fiction, but we can do it. But with it, it might raise some questions, and there may be some of you in the audience that might think, well, we're able to change these cells at will. Uh, maybe this isn't such a good thing. Are we playing God? And so I wanted to address that briefly and tell you a story about a colleague of mine, a scientist who was admittedly a bit of an arrogant scientist and a bit of a rogue scientist. And he passed away last year. Uh, but despite what I just described, he did make it into heaven. And when he got to heaven, like his usual self, he walked straight up to God, walked right at him, looked him in the eye and said, God, we don't need you anymore. Science has figured out a way to create life out of nothing, just like you did in the beginning. So God looked at him and said, well, that sounded a bit like Reagan, didn't it? <laughs> well, son, please tell me more. So the scientist looked at him and said, well, we figured out that if we mold dirt into the likeness of you and then breathe life into it, we can create man. So God looked at him and said, wow, son, that's very interesting. Please show me. So the scientist leaned down to earth and started molding the dirt into the likeness of man. As God looked over his shoulder, he watched him doing this and he went, uh-uh-uh. Not so fast, son. Get your own dirt. <laughs> and I tell you that story because I want you to keep in mind, as I tell you what we can do now, remember that we're just using God's own dirt. When we change one cell type into another, we're using what nature normally uses to make that happen. We're just doing it in a bit of an unconventional way. And, redeploying God's own secrets in 
creating the cell types that we want. And so at the Gladstone Institutes, that you heard, as you heard, we focus on three major diseases of mankind. And overlaid on these three diseases, which, which really threaten our, our country and the livelihood, both from the health perspective as well as from an economic perspective, as I'm sure all of you realize, overlaid on these three disease areas, we've developed a stem cell program that leverages our deep knowledge of disease in these three areas and uses stem cell approaches to tackle these. And we are fortunate that last year, the Roddenberry Foundation, uh, honoring Gene Roddenberry, who is the creator of Star Trek, uh, decided to name our stem cell center because what we do resonates with what Gene Roddenberry always said, which was, live long and prosper. And one of the ways that we think we can do this is through the use of stem cell biology. And all of you have heard a lot about stem cells in the press, I'm sure, and the news. And there's tremendous potential around the use of these cells. Uh, but there are also many challenges. And what I'd like to share with you is, is how we might think about this technology. And it's true that there's hope that stem cells could be utilized to treat most human diseases, some of which are shown on this slide, but really almost every disease you can think of, as I'll show you, can, might be affected by stem cell approaches. So what is it that makes stem cells so special? And I should say that there are two types of stem cells, adult stem cells and embryonic stem cells. Adult stem cells have the property that they can turn into cell types of one particular organ where they came from, but it's only embryonic stem cells that have the potential to turn into virtually every cell type in your body. No other cell type has that property. And so before I tell you more about that, I wanted to make sure everybody's on the same page with, which, uh, regarding what is it that defines an embryonic stem cell. And there are really only two things that you need to know, two things. One is that every time a embryonic stem cell divides, one of the two daughter cells is identical to the parent. And that's what allows this loop for this to go on indefinitely. And these cells can then be grown in a dish for years and years because they, what we call, self-renew. The second property is that the other cell has the potential to become every cell type in the human body. And it does so through a progressive series of steps where it restricts its potential ultimately to, so that it becomes a mature cell type, either a brain, heart, muscle cell, et cetera. And then it's fixed in that state, and it can't go back. Now, an adult stem cell is somewhere in midway where it can only become a subset of those cells, as I mentioned. So how is it that a cell, all the cells you see on this slide, have the exact same DNA, yet they're so different? A heart cell is clearly very different from a brain cell, but the genetic code in the cell is exactly the same. So in the last few years, we've begun to now understand exactly how that occurs. And what we know now from the sequencing of the human genome is that our DNA encodes for about 25,000 genes. And each of those genes makes a protein. And it's the protein that does all the work in the cell. So in any given cell in your body, it turns out that only a fraction of those 25,000 genes are actually making proteins that are active. And everything else is silent. So imagine that your brain cell has five, a set of 5,000 genes that are on and being turned on and being made into proteins. And the other 20,000 are silenced. They're off. Well, that's what makes that a brain cell. And in a heart cell, it would be a different set of 5,000 that are on and a different set of 20,000 that are off. And the reason I go into the depth on explaining this is that imagine if you could control which 5,000 were on and which 20,000 were off, well, then you could tell a cell what to be, right? Because that's what determines the fate of the cell. And what I'll show you is that we can do that now, and it turns out that although it may seem very complex, it's actually really simple. And just to show this, illustrate this schematically, what you see here is a chromosome. And we all have 46 of these in every one of your cells. And this is how DNA is packaged. Imagine 
on this chromosome, if the blue stripes were all on and everything else is off, then that cell would be a brain cell. But if the green stripes were active and everything else was off, it would be a heart cell. And so that, if you could just control that, you could control the fate of a cell. And it turns out that what's unique about an embryonic stem cell is that those stripes are poised. They're all poised to either be turned on or turned off. They haven't yet made the decision. And that's why an embryonic stem cell is what we call pluripotent, meaning it has the potential to become a plurality of cells and can do anything. It's uninstructed at this point or naive. Now, where do em these embryonic stem cells come from? This is part of the problem. What you see on this slide is the stages that a, an egg goes through after it's been fertilized by sperm. And the, the stage here is what a five-day-old fertilized embryo looks like. And if one takes the group of cells that are right here and takes them out of the embryo and puts them in a dish, we can grow these as embryonic stem cells, and they can, they can divide indefinitely, and they can turn into any cell type of the body. And so this is what raised so much hope, is the fact that we could do this. And this was just discovered in 1998. Um, but as all of you know, it also raised a lot of ethical issues because it's in, this involved destruction of the five-day-old embryo. There's another problem with this approach in that if we wanted to use these cells ultimately to treat somebody, say, with heart failure and put these cells into a patient, they were not their own cells. They were somebody else's cells from another, somebody else's embryo. And so your body would recognize that as different from your own cells and try to reject it just like it would an organ transplant. So we could do this, but it would involve suppressing your immune system. And so one of the uh, discoveries that all, had also occurred now over 50 years ago, actually exactly 50 years ago, was, is shown here. And this could get around one of the issues of the rejection. And the reason is that uh, Sir John Gurdon in England had described in 1962 that if you took an adult cell out of a frog, <clears throat> which was already knew what the cell was, it was fixed in time, we thought it could never go back, that those stripes were already fixed, that you could take the nucleus, which is here, out of that adult cell, transfer it into an egg of the frog. And the egg turned out to have this magic in it that could reset that nucleus and the DNA and make those stripes poised once again as if they were an embryonic state. And therefore, this egg with the nucleus from the adult frog could then again give rise to the equivalent of a five-day-old embryo. If you put this embryo back into a frog, uh, you could then create a new frog. So this is called cloning. And it turns out in fast forward uh, 45 years, maybe it's 30, 35 years, uh, Ian Wilmot uh, did the same thing in mammals and did it in sheep. And I suppose all of you have heard do of Dolly the sheep. So Dolly is shown here. And Ian Wilmot took out the nucleus, the cell uh, from the mammary gland of a sheep and transferred this nucleus. And lo and behold, was, be able, to, was able to create a cloned sheep. Now, uh, just as an aside, uh, he, called, he named this sheep Dolly because it came, the cells came from the mammary gland, and he thought he should honor uh, our most iconic figure of the mammary gland. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, I should say, when I gave this talk at the Bohemian Grove, uh, it, it was all men, and I did have a picture of Dolly here, but I decided against that <laughs> for obvi obvious reasons. Now. It, it turns out that we wouldn't ever want to create clone a human, but if we could create this stage from your own skin cell, let's say, then these cells we could take and make embryonic stem cells, and they would be your own. And then you could use those as your own cells and not have to worry about rejection. But it turns out that while we could do this in sheep, we could do this in cats, dogs, virtually every other farm animal and domesticated am animal, this turned out to be impossible to do with human cells for reasons we still don't understand. But we just couldn't do it, and we still haven't been able to do it. So the real breakthrough then in this area came through a discovery made by Shinya Yamanaka, 
who's an investigator at the Gladstone Institute and also runs a laboratory at Kyoto and goes back and forth. He actually trained at Gladstone in the mid-1990s. And I should mention that one of the major missions of Gladstone is not just to do the science of the future, but to also train the scientists of the future. And so he, Shinya is one of the examples of our training program. And this is, has to do with science education and obviously resonates with the mission of the Pioneer Institute. And so here's the discovery that Shinya made. He found that he could take a collection of just four genes. And these were of the categories where we call master genes because they control thousands of other genes. A combination of just four genes were enough to do the magic of the egg, to recreate that magic of the egg, in that if we introduce these four genes into an adult skin cell, it could set these, the, turn back the clock and make this cell now behave just like an embryonic stem cell in virtually every way we can measure. And so these cells were pluripotent again, and we, he had induced these cells to become pluripotent, and he therefore named these cells IPS cells for short, induced pluripotent stem cells, being in the Bay Area and all as a, as a uh, call out to Apple, of course. I everything, these were called IPS cells, and that name has stuck. And obviously, the benefit here is that these can be are personalized and that they would have the exact same DNA code as your own cell because they came from your cells. But it has the also, also has the added benefit of never having to go through this stage of needing to make a human embryo. And so this discovery has obviated the ethical debate around the use of uh, having to use embryonic stem cells. We still need to use embryonic stem cells because they remain the gold standard and we're still refining this technology to make these cells closer and closer to embryonic stem cells. But at least we now have a technology that everybody can get behind regardless of their religious and ethical beliefs. And so that's been a game changer. And it, and it was easy. Within a year, every stem cell laboratory in the world had adopted this technology and uh, was able to use it. And so not surprisingly, based on what I've described to you in 2012, just last month, uh, the Nobel Prize Committee chose to award the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine to this technology of what we call cellular reprogramming because we're reprogramming the DNA of a cell to behave in a different way. And they bookended this award quite beautifully with John Gurdon, who 50 years ago described that an egg had this magic, and Shinya Yamanaka, who described a practical way to recreate that magic. And Shinya likes to say that the year that John Gurdon made his seminal discovery with frog embryos was the same year that he himself was an embryo. <laughs> because he just celebrated his 50th birthday in September of this year. And so I want to show you a movie now that uh, tries to conceptualize what this discovery is. What you see here are balls that are sitting here atop this landscape. And this landscape is meant to define the the different cell types that might be occup uh, occupy these valleys. And we always used to think that once the cells came down into one of these valleys, that then that was a, a fixed state and it could never really go change because they were fixed. And what Shinya showed is by inserting these four genes into an adult cell, that he could actually push the cell back in time, back up the hill, so it was reset and now had the option again to go into any one of these valleys. So what can we do with this technology? How might this help the diseases that I raised earlier? And so one of the ways that cells can be used is that we can take a patient who might have a disease, let's say, in the first instance, Parkinson's disease, where a specific type of cell in the brain is lost, and we'd want to replace those cells. Now we can take cell, skin cells from that patient, introduce these reprogramming factors, and make iPS cells that have the same genetic code as that patient. And if we are able to turn those stem cells now into the exact type of brain cell that's been lost, we could then transplant those cells into the brain and restore their function. And today, we can, in fact, make the right types of cells. And now many investigators, including those at Gladstone, are working on how best to deliver these cells back into the brain in a safe and effective manner. 
And people are doing this for many, many different diseases all over the world. And while this technology is still probably many years away to being in people, uh, it, I'm pleased to say that uh, the first clinical trials using these cells are slated for next year for a type of blindness known as macular degeneration in the hopes of restoring the vision using these cells. Now, there's a lot of hope for these cells, and, but they're a few years away. But there's another use of these cells that you probably haven't heard about that's not a few years away. It's happening today. It's ready now. And that is to use these cells to create the drugs of the future. So what do I mean by that? Imagine now for a moment that this patient has Alzheimer's disease, and we want to find a cure, a new drug for Alzheimer's. Well, right now, the way the pharmaceutical industry has done this is they find a potential drug, they test it on a kidney cell from a hamster. And if it works there, then we try it in people. Well, not so surprisingly, maybe, in the last decade, every Alzheimer's degree that, uh, drug that's been tried has failed. Imagine, however, if you are able to test your drug on a brain cell from a patient with Alzheimer's disease, and if it worked there, the odds might be higher that it might work in, the, in, in people. Obviously, the problem is you can't take a biopsy of somebody's brain and do that. But now, now with this technology, we can take a skin cell from a patient with Alzheimer's, turn it into an iPS cell, then turn it into the exact type of cell that's being affected in Alzheimer's. And now what do you have? You have in a dish in front of you a brain cell from a patient with Alzheimer's. And now if you test your drug there and it works, it still may not work in the whole human when you go to test it, but boy, the odds are going to be higher. And so that's what we're trying to do now for a whole host of diseases. At the Gladstone Institutes, we've made these types of cells for drug discovery from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, Lou Gehrig's disease, a whole host of cardiac disorders, and others around the world, including many here at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, are doing the same for multitudes of diseases. So this promises to change how we'll do drug discovery and change the paradigm and increase the odds of success. Now, in order to do this, one has to, either this arm or this arm, one has to efficiently be able to make the cell types that you need for either regenerative medicine or drug discovery. And so we, we and others have spent a lot of time the last few years in learning how do we take these new cells and direct them into what we want. And what I can tell you is now, for most cell types, we can make the cells we need. And I'll just show you one example here. What you're seeing here, about to see in a movie, or a group of cells that used to be on somebody's skin. We turned them into iPS cells and then redirected them to become beating heart cells that look like this. And so these, there are thousands of cells on this dish that you're seeing, and they're beating in synchrony with one another because they're all electrically connected even. This is amazing. This is science fiction. These used to be on somebody's skin. And now they're beating like heart cells. You can never, we never imagined we would be able to do this. Now, there's another use of these cells. So I've told you about regenerative medicine, and I've told you about drug discovery. Well, what about personalized medicine? All of you have heard, again, in the press, personalized medicine. Well, I would argue that iPS cells are the ones that are going to usher in, finally, the era of personalized medicine. And the reason is that every time I give somebody a drug, the diseases I take care of, I know, I know before I give them that seven out of those 10 people are going to have benefit from that drug, but three are not going to have any effect whatsoever. But I don't know who those three are, so I give everybody the medicine and I figure, well, we'll, figure, we'll see who it helps and who does it. But what if we didn't have to do that, but rather we could stratify and predict using their own cells who would respond to a medicine and who wouldn't? even before we give it to them. Then I could give these people the drug and find a different drug to give these people. That's personalized medicine. But even among the people that would benefit from a drug, every time I do that, I know that there may be one out of 10 of those people who's going to have a bad side effect. It could be as mild as a, rat, as a rash, 
or it could be as severe as sudden death. But I don't know who that one person is, so I give the medicine to everybody, and I cross my fingers and hope nothing happens. That's not good enough. We should be doing better than that. And now you can imagine that we might be able to take these cells from these people, make iPS cells, turn them into the type of cell that might have a toxic effect, and actually test on those cells whether or not they'll have a toxic effect or not. And then for these people that might have a bad side effect, we don't give them that medicine, but we can give it to everybody else. And the, the importance of this is that every time a pharmaceutical company spends a billion dollars, gets a drug to market, and then they treat millions of people, then they find out, despite their best efforts to predict, that a small percentage of people have sudden death from that drug. And then it gets pulled, they get sued, and that medicine is gone, and that money, that investment's gone. But it's not just the investment. There are all these people that were benefiting from that drug, that were patient for many years, then they finally got a drug, and now they don't have that drug anymore. And that's not right. And I feel strongly about this because my wife is one of those. The chronic illness she suffers from uh, might be helped a bit by a drug that does cause sudden death in some people, and so it's not sold in the United States. And she could benefit from it, and for her, it's worth taking that risk. But she can't get that medicine. So imagine if we were able to identify those who might have the sudden death or toxic effects, then they wouldn't get it, but everybody else could get that medicine. And that would be a good thing. OK, so what I've shown you so far are some of the potential uses for these new type of stem cells that really change the paradigm of how we might treat people in the future and how we might handle the pharmaceutical industry in the future and how they might do drug discovery. I want to now turn to a specific use of this issue of cellular reprogramming that, is, that relates to work done in my own laboratory related to heart disease. So what you see on this slide is an image, a classic image, of a man having a heart attack. Well, not just men have heart attack. Heart attacks are the leading cause of death for men, but also for women. Number one cause of death for both men and women. There are about a million new heart attacks every year in the United States, and there are about five million people who survive those heart attacks, but are left with damaged hearts, and ultimately the heart can't pump enough to support their circulation, and they have what we call heart failure. And right now, the only treatment for end-stage heart failure is a heart transplant, but there are only about 2,000 of those done every year because there simply aren't enough donors. And this is what a heart looks like after a heart attack. Uh, in this cross-section of a heart here, the red indicates good muscle, and blue or purple indicates the scar that replaces dead muscle. And this is the left ventricular cavity that you're looking at here, uh, which is the one that pumps to the body. And so all this scarred area doesn't move at all when the heart beats. It keeps the heart from blowing open, but it doesn't beat. And the heart has virtually no capacity to regenerate itself. And so the only real treatment for this disease would be to somehow create new muscle and replace the scar with new muscle. And it turns out that the cells that make up this scar come from within the heart. There is a group of cells that we call fibroblasts, and I'll use this term because I'll use it again, but fibroblast cells that make up 50% of the cells in the heart. So they, these cells form the architecture, if you will, of the heart, and they send important support signals to the muscle. And at the time of injury, they move to this area that's been injured, and they lay down the scar. So they're also the scar-forming cells. So the question we asked is, might there be a way to take advantage of the fact that half of the cells in the heart are these non-muscle cells? They're never meant to be muscle. But based on what I told you earlier, if we can control the fate of a cell at will, then maybe we could take those fibroblast cells in the heart, they're already in the organ, and now tell them to become new muscle cells. And then we could regenerate the heart sort of from within, if we could do that. And so what that involves is somehow taking this cardiac fibroblast and converting it into a muscle. And I like to call this the next generation, if you will, of reprogramming. Because 
this involves something different than making stem cells. And the way we did this or approached this is to, again, go back to God's dirt. My laboratory, because I'm a pediatric cardiologist, had spent the last 15 years addressing this disease, which is essentially a case where the heart in the embryo didn't get instructed. The cells didn't get told properly to become heart cells, and therefore a child was born with a malformed heart. And so we worked out the networks of genes that were critical to tell an embryonic cell to become a heart cell. And we realized that this might not only inform us about why children get heart disease, but maybe we could redeploy nature's own toolkit that was telling these cells to become heart cells and now take these non-muscle cells and try to make them into muscle cells. And that's exactly what we were able to do. It turns out that a combination now of just three master genes, different than the ones I told you about before, now the ones, master genes, that tell a heart cell to become a heart cell in an embryo, if we reintroduce those in the adult heart, can convert a non-muscle cell into a newly born muscle. And it does so without ever becoming a stem cell. Amazingly, these cells within days go from being one adult cell type into another without ever becoming a stem cell of any sort. And so this is what those cells look like. What you see on your, let's see, your left is a green cell that is a native, normal human cell. It has these stripes that are characteristic of a heart cell. And on your right is a cell that's more yellow because we've marked it with a red dye. And red and green, of course, make yellow. And these are what we call induced cardiac muscle cells. And they look very similar to their native counterparts. And we have a very rigorous test with the heart cell to determine if it's really a heart cell. And that is that it has to beat. And so what you see on this slide is a cell that's not green right here, which is a native heart cell, and a green cell, which is one of our newly born induced cardiac cells. And if we induce an electrical stimulus to these cells, what you can see is that the green cell beats in very much the same way as the native cell. So these cells can actually contract when we reprogram them. So I want to come back to this movie that I showed you earlier and illustrate you with, for you conceptually how this is different from what I showed you before. Essentially what we're doing now is taking cells in one valley that's already in a valley and now introducing these three developmental genes that are important for embryonic development and now not taking these balls and pushing them back up the hill, but rather getting them over the mountain into a different valley by directly going over this hump. And so this has some benefits in that one of the problems with using stem cells when we introduce for repair is that we worry that if there are some rogue stem cells that are still left up here, that when we put them in, they might not go into the right valley and might turn into something we don't want. And since these never go down that route, we have less of a risk of cancer or other unwanted side effects. OK, so with that in, in hand, that we can reprogram these cells in the heart into new muscle, we asked, could we do this well enough in an animal to make a difference, to improve the function of the heart? So, so far what we've done is we mimicked a heart attack in mice we, by tying off the coronary artery or the vessel that feeds the heart, the muscle. And when we do that in mice, uh, it mimics a heart attack, and then we injected these three genes directly into the muscle and asked, could we improve heart function? And to test this, we did ultrasounds, or echocardiograms on mice at various intervals, and finally put them in a little uh, mouse MRI machine, which is similar to ours, but smaller, uh, and did MRIs on the mice, uh, to, because that's the most accurate way to measure their heart function. Well, I'll just show you the MRI results, which are shown here. What you see on your left are images from the MRI where these circles, these are cross sections through the heart. Uh, the circle is the left ventricle that's pumping blood to the body during a relaxed stage versus in a contracted stage. And in the control setting after injury, there's not that much difference because the heart hasn't pumped out that much white or that much blood. Whereas down here in the experimental group, you can tell that there's less white here which means there's less blood after it's been, the heart squeezes. And we can quantify that and measure that as shown here with the dashed line indicating what a normal output would be from a heart 
the blue bar indicating what a damaged heart was with no treatment, and green showing that it's not back to normal, but it's a whole lot better after we treat these mice than if we don't. And now if we sacrifice these mice and look at their hearts, it, it looks something like this, where this is a injured mouse that's uh, not been treated. Uh, this is now the left ventricle cavity that pumps. And the red area, again, is normal muscle. And all this scarred area is where the muscle died. In contrast, when we treat the hearts with just these three genes, the heart looks something like this. And what you can see is that there's still a thinner wall of the ventricle. There's still damage. There's still scar here. But now you can see interspersed in this area new muscle. And we can track these cells with that red dye I mentioned and know that, in fact, these are newly born muscle cells in the area of scar. And so we're very encouraged by this result and think that this new approach of regenerating an organ from within, using the cells that are already there and harnessing them for a potential that they didn't have, uh, might be a new paradigm, not just for regenerating heart muscle, but for many, many other organs where there are cells in the vicinity that one could call upon and convert to the type that we want. And the reason I say that we, that the reason I think that this might be applicable to many cell types is that over the last uh, year or two, we now know that we can do this type of reprogramming directly from one adult cell type to another for several cell types. Other investigators at Gladstone have done the same, similar work like we did in the heart into various types of brain cells, and now they're trying it in an animal like we have. Others have done it for blood cells, and yet others have done it for liver cells. And I think in the future, as we know enough to flip the right switches on the, in the genes, that we can convert virtually every cell type, any cell type, into another cell type. So what I've tried to illustrate to you today is that there's a whole new future of medicine that lies ahead of us, that involves technology that has only developed in the last few years. And with that, this new technology, one can imagine a world where we might be able to regenerate damaged organs either through cells, these new cells that we can put in, or by harnessing the cells that are already in the organ. That we can really bring in personalized medicine by testing drugs and discovering drugs on your own cells and determining who would benefit and who wouldn't. And that we might even be able to rejuvenate the pharmaceutical industry by helping them do drug discovery on the most relevant cells, and maybe even doing clinical trials in a dish first before going into people to maximize the likelihood of success. And then finally, you hear a lot about healthcare cost, of course, in the current political climate and economic climate. And you hear a lot about bending the cost curve. And so far, we haven't been able to do anything to bend the cost curve. And short of rationing, the only way we're going to be able to do that is by changing the equation, changing the paradigm. When we think that by changing the paradigm of how we do drug discovery and making it less expensive to do drug discovery and making it more efficient to whom we deliver and use drugs, that we might, in fact, be able to bend the cost curve and even bend it by regenerative medicine. And so what I'd like to leave you with is the hope that we can imagine now a world in the future where we might be able to restore the ability of a father to run and pick up and play with his daughter. That we might be able to restore the ability of a little boy to open his eyes and see the wonders of our wonderful world. That we might be able to restore the ability of a mother to look her grown son in the eyes and actually remember his name. That's the world that we need to work for and towards, and that's what we're doing at Gladstone and many other places. And I thank you so much for your attention tonight and for inviting me to be the 2012 Peters Lecturer. Thank you.